All right? Okay, shall we pray? Lord, have your way, Father. Touch all the hungry hearts here this morning. Meet their needs <coughs> financially, physically, emotionally, mentally. Touch them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we rise, folks? It's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the old ways to change. I hear the Spirit say, it's time. It's time for the dead man to rise. It's time for the great light to shine. I hear the Spirit say, it's time. Fling wide you heavenly gates. Let the King of glory Open up the windows, let the light in, open up the windows, let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows, let the light in, open up the windows, let the light in, open up the windows, let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows, 
Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in. Let the light in, let the light in Bring wide you heavenly gates Let the King of glory in, let the King of glory in Glory 
service this morning so you're gonna be you're being for a treat but basically this morning we want to be able to recognize all the volunteers that have uh, worked so hard over the year uh, here at Kappa Missionary Church and we just want to say how much we appreciate each one of you because all of you have a part all of you play a part that makes Kappa Missionary Church Kappa Missionary Church You know, it's a great place, you know, just to gather as an ohana, just praising God, encouraging each other, praying together, serving together. You know what? Together, we make a big difference. And that's what makes Kappa Missionary Church special. Because I ask so many people, you know, what makes <coughs> Kappa Missionary Church? They says, I don't know, but I just come here and I just, I just feel I belong here. And that's what is makes it special because each one of you play a part as being uh, a family and ohana and treating your brothers and sister, sisters as one. We want to acknowledge everyone uh, who <coughs> contributed to make Kappa Missionary Place a great place. I can tru truthfully say that you make this the greatest place to come to worship, to praise God as you are called. In the beginning of the year, I, I talked about spiritual gifts. And, and this is what it's all about. It's about using the gifts that you are given. Knowing what you are, knowing that you are serving the <coughs> master, our Heavenly Father. So whenever you serve, you are serving your father, Heavenly Father. And there is no better place to be. Now, if I don't me mention your name or your ministry, uh, please forgive me. Don't be offended. Uh, there's so much that we know on our list. We are thankful for those who have stepped up to take the leadership role. I mean, <coughs> God has given you the, the gift of leadership, and you have stepped up to, to lead the ministry that you're assigned or you have volunteered to lead. And I just pray that God will continue to bless you, to encourage you, and that the spirit just dwell in you and just be excited. Be excited that the way that you serve. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in the various forms. You know, there's the gift of serving, the gift of teaching, uh, the gift of mercy, the gift of giving, the gift of organizing, the gift of exhortation or <coughs> encouragement, or even the gift of prophecy. So let me just go through the, some of the, well, actually, I want to try and see if I can hit all the ministries. And first of all, I want to acknowledge our worship team. Aren't they the greatest? I mean, they're here <coughs> every Sunday. They practice, they come early, and they serve, and they lead us in worship. You know, it's not about them. It's all about them leading you in a time of worship. So that is, that is their, their mission, their goal, to be able to get you engaged in the time of worship. We also want to acknowledge our audio-visual team. They're, 
they're the ones in the back, but they're the ones that's under the pressure all the time. Especially when things don't go quite right, they have to scramble and try to fix it. And we just appreciate them just coming up, uh, being able coming early to set up the you know, the program and be able to for us to enjoy it. I want to be able to acknowledge all our ushers and our greeters each morning as you come in. You know, they're there with that. But that's that uh, the spirit of aloha, that to be able to greet you, just handing out the bulletins that, that, and welcome you. Uh, we are appreciative of people that are, are in, involved with the decorating our church, you know, especially on special occasions. We have people that have do the <coughs> financial accounting of our tithes and offering every Sunday. You know, they, they count it and make sure that every penny is accounted for. And I, it's so good that we have a, a team that has you know, the integrity that we can trust. We are appreciative of our Sunday school teachers. You know, you know, they sacrifice a lot of their time to just be able to minister to our children. We, are, we had a coffee ministry and it's soon to be revived. Uh, and we're looking forward to having that coffee ministry back up and running in a, in a couple of weeks. <coughs> and we have, uh, Sarah, it's next week, all right. Sarah and uh, um, Andy. You know when you get older, it gets harder to remember all the names. But, <laughs> but we, we are looking forward to just kind of uh, coming back to a sense of normalcy where we can you know, still enjoy, come and enjoy coffee and talk to one another. We appreciate the people that come uh, on our communion Sunday, the first Sunday of Ishmael. They come and set up the juice, the, the, uh, the elements at the table. We have people that come in uh, during the week to uh, update our outdoor signs. You know, they do a great job. Just and people like say, you know, oh, the message was on the, the short message was was very meaningful, and I really appreciate what <coughs> we put up on the sign. We appreciate the prayer chain. I think Becky Morales is hitting our, our prayer chain, just keeping us informed of the people that are in need, that, that need extra prayer. And, and we just thank you for that. We have office helpers, people that come in to help, you know, help answer the phone, uh, fold the bulletins, <coughs> put the inserts in, and whatever else that we need around the church. We appreciate our custodian, PJ. You know, he's he's the one that's behind the scene. He makes sure the property is on the doors are open, the AC is running, the place is cool, he picks up the trash. But we really appreciate that he, all the work he has done around the church. We have people that take care of our property and our maintenance. We have an IT person or information technology person who oversees our computers, <coughs> our internet. Our, wife, uh, our internet, our, our local network, and our audiovisual equipment. So we really, really appreciate uh, Mike Davenport, the work that he does behind the scene. We have outreach ministry, food pantry. They distribute food boxes to the needy every week. They go shopping in Lihui and come back, restock our, our room so that each Saturday, they have boxes ready for those that are in need. We have the soup kitchen on, and the clothing closet and the distribution of uh, personal care items. So that happens on the second and fourth Saturday of each month. And the people really appreciate just the hot meal and the, just to be able to meet people, people of God. So you are doing a great, and actually that is our, one of our biggest outreach ministry that we have in the food pantry and the uh, soup kitchen. We are thankful for all of our Ohana groups, you know, just holding your, your people together and being in contact and checking out, checking on them. We are really appreciate for those that uh, sign up for uh, our flowers. Every Sunday we have beautiful flowers out here. And we just thank you for just signing up and just say, you know, I want to be able to make a, a flower, make the flower for this Sunday. And so we really appreciate that. 
We appreciate everyone who has given financially to help support our ministry. We appreciate all the visitors that come <coughs> to worship with us. That makes it a enjoyable just to see new faces just coming, coming uh, to worship with us. We appreciate those who take time to come and help us with the yard maintenance. We have a big yard. And we appreciate those who sit on our finance committee. They put together, they make sure that our finances are right and they do the, the budget for the year. And last of all, we want to appreciate <coughs> our current uh, people that are serving on our pastor search committee. I mean, they're done a lot of research. They, they checked out a lot of candidates and, then, and they really are done a really good job and I just want to say we appreciate them. So here at Kapa Missionary, we have so much to be thankful for. We work together to make Kapa Missionary a special place to be part of God's Ohana. So thank you all. And today, we the elders and the staff would like to bless you with a lunch Immediately after this morning's service, uh, we'll be in the in the uh, Ohana room in the back, and we also invite all our guests to come and partake of the meal that they've been we got together for you. So we invite you to come to just stay after to fellowship and also to be able to meet our guest speaker for today. And it, you'll be you'll be uh, I know you'll be pleased with what he has to share. So we have some benches in the back, and the tables are set up uh, in the Ohana room, so uh, you, can, you are free to use the place, okay? If you're not feel comfortable, you can take your benzo, you can go to the beach. <laughs> but anyway, so thank you, thank you, each one of you that make Kappa <coughs> Missionary Space special. And then, <laughs> yes, just give yourself a hand. I mean, you guys are amazing. And worship team. That's Finish and close this out with worship. Yeah, Lord, we thank you for being here. <coughs> thank you so much. Uh, we pray that uh, you would reveal yourself in greater measure for every heart present today, that we would know you more fully, that we would leave with more love and more power. More
this morning, Lord. We bring you our highest praise, Lord, for you are worthy of the highest praise. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. We worship you this morning, Lord. And we can say we want more of you. We know that when we asked you into our hearts, you came and, and you dwelt therein. And you give us your all. And we just love you so much that we want more. We want all of you, Lord, all the time. Love beyond measure from the heart of God. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. We honor you this morning. We give you our highest praise this morning, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Testing. Good morning. I'm here to um, give the offering. I just want to expound on a word for a while. Um, the word commitment. It's a pretty heavy word, you know. You know, we have commitment to our our spouse, you know. In sports, there's a word called committing yourself to the shot, you know. Last week, we had the Super Bowl. And the day after the Super Bowl, I was reading an article about some of the defensive players and how they were committed to every play, you know. They were all in, you know. They gave it all, our, all they got in every play. And likewise, um, how we are committed with our walk with the Lord, you know. It takes a lot, you know. I mean, is is God Jesus our first love, you know? Is it Jesus and God it comes first in all our matters? Something we have to commit to. Commitment is a heavy word, you know. And there's one way we can commit, and that's through our tithes and offerings. So let us pray. Father God, um, we just thank you for this day and the unconditional and steadfast love that you give us every day, Lord, and your mercies, which are so wonderful to us, Lord. And right now, as we commit our tithes and offerings to you, Lord, may it be blessed by you, Lord, that it will further your kingdom, but also the good news for people who don't know you. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nani <laughs> 
Good morning. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to introduce our guest speaker this morning. But before I do that, I would like to speak. We're speaking about Appreciation Day. I'd like to recognize Jane and Stacy for everything they do. They're the glue that holds this place together. Thank you. Also, uh, from the pulpit, we've had Arnold step up, Bob, Pastor Ed, Pastor Jerry, to fill in the gap. And uh, we really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Pastor Search Committee uh, met for several months and went over several resumes. And uh, this morning's guest speaker is the person we chose to come over and give a message this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker to you. He is currently the senior pastor at Leon Christian Church in Leon, Kansas, where he has been the, in that position since 2010. He is also the current director for Wrestlers for Christ in Wichita, Kansas, and he's been serving in that position since 2018. He has Hawaiian ties from his military days where he lived in Oahu for nearly eight years while serving in the 25th Infantry. I would like to read what he said when asked by the search committee, what is your impression of Hawaii? I have always viewed Hawaii as a second home for me. The years I lived on Oahu were some of my fondest memories as I made many relationships and grew in my faith. We have made many trips back to Hawaii since I moved to the mainland, and I have found it becoming more and more difficult to leave each time. I am feeling God's call back to Hawaii and feel that his desire is to do his ministry here there. I feel, I feel a strong need to share the Great Commission through sharing his love all throughout Hawaii. And I would like to present to you Pastor Kelly Benton, and his lovely wife, Stacy. <laughs> and, and I'm sure we're going to be inspired by what he has this morning. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it. I was wondering what I said. I forgot what I said. So he, was re he says, I'm going to read what he said. I, I, want, I was curious too. Amen. Well, aloha. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, we've anticipated coming here for quite some time. Um, we showed up this morning and um, was greeted by a sound I have not heard in quite a while. And I'm sitting there thinking, and as, as Brother John said, uh, you know, I, I lived in Hawaii for nearly eight years, and we've made several trips back and forth to the islands, and we love Hawaii, you know, and it does feel like home. And I heard a, a noise that reminded me of Kansas. It sounded like a duck. And I told myself, I don't remember seeing ducks in Hawaii. And it was like, ah, 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 ah. looked over, it's a pug or a Boston Terrier over here, barking at us. He came running out with a bull terrier and they greeted us. Oh, it was nice. It, it, it was confirmation that we were, we were coming home, amen. It was nice. Well, this morning, um, I believe that there's somebody pretty powerful that did not want me here. Satan. I believe Satan didn't want us here. And I believe that because I believe that I've got a message straight from God that he wanted me to share with each of you today. Uh, I feel it in my bones more now today as I stand before you than I did in earlier weeks. I believe this because of the obstacles that we had to partake in to get here. Uh, we've been planning for quite some time to be here. Uh, the day before we left, I found myself in the emergency room, passing a kidney stone. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. But praise God, I passed that thing, and I was back on my feet. And I was like, no, Satan, you can't stop me there. We're, we're still going. Amen. So the next day, we wake up, and it's icing and snowing. And I thought to myself, ah, that's no big deal. My wife works for the airlines. She's at work right now. She would have called me and told me if the flight was going to be canceled. And she never called. I said, oh, we're good to go. So I get up to the airport, and of course, the flights were canceled. <laughs> so I told myself, well, Satan's trying to stop us. 
He's not going to prevail. So we got in the car and we drove through the ice and snow two and a half hours, which should have been a two and a half hour drive to Oklahoma City. It took about three, maybe three and a half because of the ice and snow. We arrived, we got on the plane, and through circumstances, it was a crazy ordeal. We even got kicked off of a flight because it was too heavy. (laughs) Who's heard of that, huh? Cargo. They were loading cargo, so we had to take another flight. took us a while to get here, but uh, praise God we're here. And like I said, I do believe that it, it was all because of Satan trying to stop us. And I understand that whenever you're faced with trials of many kinds, right, that it is our call to continue pressing forward. That is confirmation that God is blessing you and saying, yes, you have got a message to give. You've got a mission to give, and God wants you to be a blessing. Do not give up. Do not give up. You know, I believe that our purpose as as Christians is to live out our lives in such a way that brings glory to God and and to bring souls to Christ. Amen? Would you agree to that? You know, bringing Jesus to people is not just my call as a a pastor. You see, my position as a pastor is not uh, to be a soul winner, you see. It's really not. My position as a Christian is to be a soul winner, amen? That's my position, and and by the way, that's your position as well. Now, I do believe that evangelism and soul winning can be a very frightening and scary thing in our minds. Whenever you bring up the the word evangelism, the first thing that comes to mind for most people is door-to-door knocking on doors, you see. Uh, having a Bible in one hand, knocking on doors, and, and, and trying to spread the gospel with a salesman's smile, so to speak, to teach someone of Jesus. But I believe that each of us, thank you, brother, I believe that each of us are very capable of evangelism and reaching souls for Christ. I believe that's our call as Christians, don't you? I believe each of us are highly successful and can be highly successful in bringing people to Christ. And I believe that it's reaching our friends for Jesus is more apt to be successful than bringing a complete and total stranger to Christ. And I want to share this with you today. You see, it's something called friendship evangelism that I have built my ministry all around that God has blessed me through. It's nothing new when you think about it. When you talk about the, the word friendship evangelism, uh, you know, it's, it's nothing new. We, we see that this is the same method that Jesus himself used. Uh, we read about that Paul describes in our text this morning that I'll be sharing briefly with you. It's found in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And, and Paul presents this in a great way. I want to share it with you. Uh, three components, really, that makes up your uh, friendship evangelism. The first one is of information. And I encourage you to take notes if you can today and write, write down these notes. Take them home and really ponder upon what God is speaking to you on. So the first one's information, and let me read to you 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 6. This is what the Word of God says here. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi. As you know, but, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we were never used, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask (laughs) to cover up our greed. Uh, but God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. You know, as, as you read this and as we look at this, Paul's words, you, you know, you can't help but feel a sense of urgency in how he's presenting the gospel and how possibly we are to get that same urgency to present the gospel as well, yeah? Paul's saying, in spite of strong opposition, we did not hesitate to tell you about Jesus. I think about the world we live in now. How much opposition do we have? A lot, yeah? A lot of opposition in sharing Christ with the world. So much opposition. Sometimes people 
are afraid to even mention his name in a crowded room. And if you do, boy, it's like parting the Red Sea. Everybody gets away from me, yeah? Oh, there's one of those crazy Bible thumpers. Or, you know, it, it's crazy that we live in a society in current times such as these. But that, just like my uh, confirmation in coming to Kauai was from God because of all the opposition, this should be a confirmation for each of you that it is a much-needed thing. We must keep pressing forward, sharing Christ. You see, he knows that people are dying in their sins, and he, he realizes that no matter what happens to him, that they have to hear about the good news of Jesus. This is how Paul's kind of painting the picture Friends, we have a lot of people dying in their sins today in our world. We must press forward. And in order for us to get really, truly serious about telling our friends and our family about Jesus, we have got to come to the realization that they're all lost. There's a lot of lost souls out there that need Jesus, and they're not going to be with us in heaven unless we do something about it. I don't know about you, but I didn't just decide one morning to wake up and go into a church. And, and give my life to Christ. That's, that's not how it happened for me, you see. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm a little crazy thinking that, but I'm willing to bet that the way you came to Christ was possibly you were raised in the church, which is great. But for others, it was because of an invitation. More than likely, it was from an invitation from somebody called a friend. Yeah. There's power in that, isn't there? You know, and we, we think about all the lost and all these souls that need Christ, and, and we know there's a, a dire need for this. So why aren't we sharing Jesus with them? You know, the reason I believe that many Christians don't tell their friends about Jesus is because they are afraid. The idea of sharing Jesus with our friends can be very intimidating. You know, I remember growing up, so many friends I had that were involved with different things and hobbies and things that interested them that didn't interest me, but I wanted to be their friends so much that whenever they would talk about certain things, I found myself agreeing with them. I like to drive cars. I understand I put the key in it and I start it. It comes on. I, I'm smart enough to know that my right foot will press the gas and it will go. And, my, and if I press the other one, it will stop. That's all I know, yeah? That's it. But I have a lot of friends that know everything else about the cars and, and the engines and the torque. and the. I'm not even going to try to tell you the words because I don't know them. I know nothing about vehicles. But when they would talk about vehicles, you know what I would do? Oh, yeah, 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 454 in there. Yeah, it's a good car. Yeah, it's a good car. And, and I would do that because I wanted them to like me. I wanted to fit in, you see? That's how friendships work. <laughs> you know, I've heard a lot of preachers say that the reason Christians don't really tell others about Jesus is because they're ashamed of him. I don't believe that at all. I believe that most Christians love Jesus deeply, and we desire to share Christ with others, but we're afraid that we won't fit in. We're afraid they're going to not really ostracize us, but not really accept us, Yeah. And it kind of separates us from doing God's will. And much like I would sit there and agree over the vehicles and everything else, that's kind of how we do when it comes to presenting Christ. We're kind of afraid that they won't agree with us, so we kind of keep quiet and we don't say anything. We're, we're not sure what we could say about Jesus, even though we, we're very passionate and we love him and we want to share him. We don't really know exactly how to approach it in a conversation. We've bought the enemy's lie, hook and sinker, really. We have that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough to share Christ. You know, that, that almost kept me from the ministry years ago. It did. I, I knew that I had a calling for, for Jesus. I knew that I had to do something for him. I, I didn't know what it was. I knew it was ministry. I, 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 had, I grew up, I had a stuttering problem. I had to go to class, special classes to learn how to speak. I, I stuttered horribly. And whenever I would get up in front of people, I just would stutter. It was horrible. So my whole life, I really had to train myself how to learn how to speak. And I was definitely not a public speaker. Definitely not. But I knew I had to get training. I started going to seminary. I was going to church in Waihu, Hawaii, on Oahu. And I was going through seminary during this time, teaching a Sunday school class and, and really trying to fit in and find out where I needed to be. And, and I remember getting a call that they wanted me to fill in for an evening service to preach. And I... I answered 
yes without thinking about it. And I realized what I had answered to. I got up and I gave the, the message and it was horrible. It was horrible. It was, it was bad. It was worse than this one today. Yeah. <laughs> it was horrible. So I went home. I prayed to God, I'm not doing that again. There's no way. Please, God, don't make me do that. I cannot preach again. I can't speak in front of people. What? Oh, I know you know what you're doing, but what are you doing? Please, don't, don't have that. You know, show me a sign of, of what it is you want me to do. A sign. And I fell asleep praying this prayer. And I woke up to a sign. The telephone rang, and I answered it. It was Waihoa, Hawaii, the First Baptist Church. Brother, we loved that sermon last night. Can you come back and do it again next Sunday night? I said, yeah. I hung up the phone. I said, oh. That was my sign. <laughs> because we think we're not good enough, you see. We're not smart enough. And that almost kept me from going forward until I realized it's not me. It's, it's God, you see. It's, it's his spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will embed into us and give us the strength to move forward. It's not us. We've made evangelism too difficult. We've made it too difficult. We think evangelism is for some big, deep theological studies that you've got to be well-educated and well-spoken and well-versed and this and that. And It's very simple, friends. It, it really is. And I believe that the most effective way to tell someone about Jesus is to simply just use your everyday language. Jesus taught in parables. He taught things of the day. He, he didn't get all... Uh, educated with them, so to speak. He kept things very simple and how they could relate, and he shared it as a friend. I believe we can't force the conversation. We just have to let it come naturally, don't you? And that makes sense when you think about it. Think about it. You, you, you can be at work or you can be with friends or, or, or a family meal and, and just spending a great time, and you can just casually say something along the lines like, hey, uh, you know, man, we, I was at church last week and something really amazing happened. It was really cool. And just sit there and don't say anything. What are they going to say? They're going to say, oh, yeah, what was, what was that? And then you just tell them. Let it go naturally. Let them be the one who asks why it was so amazing, what was going on. You can tell them, oh, I was with an Ohana group last week, and we were at the beach, or we met over here, we, we had a cookout, we were talking story, whatever we were doing, and it was a wonderful experience. And, and just be quiet and let them ask more questions of that. Really? What happened? What did you talk about? What made it so great? You see, the door is open at that point. God just opened that door for you. Walk in. Walk in and just simply talk. That's it. You're not being preachy. You're not trying to force your beliefs upon anybody. You're simply making conversation. You're sharing your life, your information of Jesus and his church in a very non-threatening way. You know, I've had the, I don't know if it's, it's not a pleasure, driving to get a new car. You drive onto a car lot, and the first thing you see is all these salesmen, they come running to you. Oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. Because you know they're trying to sell you a car. Yes, I'm trying to buy a car, but I don't want to be forced to buy a car. I don't want to buy, don't force, just let me do my thing. But they're coming out there to sell a car. I've bought more cars from people that have not pushed selling a car on me than not. That says something powerful as far as sharing Christ, right? You know, the days of standing on a street corner with a Bible, yelling, fire and brimstone, repent, 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 believe... Those days are kind of over. And really, the days of door knocking is over as well. You know, certain denominations have been pretty successful over the years of knocking on doors, but it's not so much anymore. So how do we reach them? In a non-threatening way. And the more we talk about Jesus and his church in a very non-threatening way on how he's changed our lives, how he's blessed our lives, the more and more, I believe, people, our friends and family will want to know. They'll want to worship with us. They'll want to study with us. They want to know more about this Jesus. And I think the main thing is just be ourselves. Share our opportunities that we've been dealt with in life and experiences we've dealt with. That's as far as participation. I, I think when I look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 through 9, it says, But we were gentle among you. Like a mother caring for her little children, we love you so much that we were 
delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Participation. It's getting involved with other people, building relationships. Oh, relationship building is so huge, friends. You know, Paul said, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother tenderly caring for her children. You know, there's, there's no way. There's no way that we're going to bring people to Jesus without being kind, without being gentle, without sharing the aloha spirit with them. It's not going to happen. It doesn't happen. The truth is, is if you're rude, if you're sarcastic, if you're obnoxious, if you're conceited, whatever it is, it will unlikely be a successful moment in evangelism for you. It won't happen. Think of it like this. Let's say you're at Safeway or Big Save, okay? You're in a hurry. You're getting your last-minute preparations for a meal that you're taking home to your ohana. You've got things going on. You want to take it home. You're, you've had a bad day at work or whatever you dealt with. You are just in a very, very bad mood. You're standing there. Somebody's in front, and, and you've got a brand-new person checking you out, the checkout line, which is nice, by the way, to at least have them working, amen? You go to some places, it's all automatic now. It's horrible. Young, young gal trying to learn her job. She's messing up. She's taking forever. And you are back there because the person in front of you and it's taking so long and you're just so, so upset. You're as mad as a hornet. As soon as you get up to the front, she's trying to check you out. And she's still messing up. And you're rude and you say, ah, would you just hurry up? I've got places to go. Can't, can't you figure this out? Are you smart enough to figure this out? Or, or you, maybe you're a person that don't say anything. But you definitely are giving them stink eye, and you're just sitting there looking her up and down, yeah? <laughs> and she feels this pressure and this tension, and she knows. But you're horrible. You're just a mean, mean person. You get your things. You go home. And, oh, by the way, this is Saturday, so you got to go to church the next day. You go to church. You're in here, and things are going great. Oh, it's a wonderful moment. And next thing you know, you see a familiar face walking inside. It's the same checkout lady, yeah? And she comes in, and she, you're like, oh, I better put my mask back on. <laughs> and she sees you, and you lock eyes. <laughs> and at that moment, she looks at you, and she's giving you the stink eye. <laughs> and she turns around, she walks out, never to come back, never to come back. You know, Paul dealt with the, the uh, Thessalonians with love, compassion, gentleness, companionship. He knew that he had to be friends with the Thessalonians if he was ever going to bring them to Jesus. Paul said, we love you so much that not only were we wanting to share the gospel, but our own lives as well. You see, this is friendship evangelism. At its best, this really is. When we, when we begin to share our lives with others, when we, we share through compassion and kindness with all those that are around us, we see Jesus working because Jesus is love, yeah? It's all love. And if we are not going to be loving and compassionate and kind to other people, we're definitely not being Christians. Did you know the word Christian literally means to be Christ-like? So if you say you're a Christian, are you being Christ-like? And Christ-like, and that's all about love. How do we show people that we care? Because this is important. To be friendly. We've got to learn to be friendly. We should have a smile on our face, even when we don't feel like doing it. Oh, I can think of my grandmother always smiling. And I know she didn't feel like it, but she was always smiling. To have kind words on our lips. And I believe the more a person knows you, likes you, and trusts you, the better your conversations are going to work out. That Jesus and his word will flow through all that you do and what you say. I believe it's important that we make friends with others to share yourself. And to share yourself, I mean to truly share your life. 
Invite people over for dinner. Get to know them. Share your interests, your likes, your dislikes. Go to the movies. Uh, go out to eat. Do whatever. Take them golfing. Go shopping. Whatever it is you have going on, invite people to go and build a true relationship with others. And, you know, I'm even going to be as bold to tell you to do these things before you invite them to church. People are more apt to do something outside of church with you than come to church with you until they know you. It's an odd thing to think, but it's true. This is how you cultivate friendships, you see. When we share our lives, showing people that we've got a genuine love and concern for them. They'll want to know more of us. They'll see that we care, that we're not trying to deceive them, that we simply want to be a part of their lives. And that's when they're more willing to accept an invitation to come to church. Paul became friends with the Thessalonians. He, he shared the gospel. He shared his life. And the Thessalonians were more eager to hear about the gospel because of Paul's genuine concern for their life. And in fact, people, you know, people, they don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. Here's my last point. We're getting close to ending. Demonstration. So in 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, this is what the word of God tells us. That you are witnesses. And so is God. Of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. We are to live a life of Christ. This is it, friends. And you know, our non-Christian friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, they are watching us, each and every one of us, to see if we really truly believe what we profess. If we're real or not. How can you show a friend the importance of worshiping God? If you're not in a regular worship yourself. If you're not regular with your church attendance, they know that. They see that. They understand that. How can you tell someone of the love and mercy of God if you refuse to forgive them? Because people are going to make you mad and hurt your feelings. Have you noticed that? Anybody ever not been hurt by anybody? If you refuse to forgive them and if you hold that grudge, <laughs> they, they see that. And then they start calling you the famous word that so many of us have heard over the years. Hypocrite, right? Oh, you hypocrite, I want nothing to do with your church. I have nothing to do with your God because you didn't forgive me because I, I borrowed your, your rake and I didn't bring it back to you in time or whatever. <laughs> and then they see that. We can't be that way, you see? We can't. Paul said, you and God are witnesses of how devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly we behave toward you. Paul knew that he, he couldn't teach on love if he didn't love. He knew this. He knew that he couldn't preach on, preach on purity if he wasn't pure himself. And he knew that he couldn't teach about faith if he wasn't faithful. Friends, ask yourself this question this morning. Are you faithful? Are you faithful with your regular attendance? Do you come every time the doors are open? Do you, do you see the church as the hub of your life? Do you see this as a moment that really defines your week? Or do you come just to check off a box? Or do you just simply come once a month or once a quarter or when special things are happening? How faithful are you with your attendance in worshiping God collectively as a family of believers? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, you know, Pastor, I, I can't really remember a person that I really led to Christ. And, and I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I've never invited anybody to church. And, I, and if I did, I don't think they'd come. If that's you, then perhaps God's talking to you today. Perhaps you're the person that Satan was trying to keep me from coming to tell you about today. Perhaps this message was for you. And if it's just for one of you today, then, then God bless you. Because that's exactly why I'm here today. No other reason. You know, Paul knew that his life had to correspond with his teaching. Paul wasn't perfect. 
You know, we, we read in Romans 7 and we, we see his struggles and the sin, just like everybody else that he dealt with. But he was striving to live a life of Christ to the best of his ability. And, and this should be an encouraging word. I mean, if he was striving and he, we're talking about him today over 2,000 years later, you know, maybe we can be this way too. Maybe we can continue to strive to be better. We're not perfect, but we can be better. You know, this is what God expects of us. He wants to make every effort for us to follow him and Jesus. And when we do make mistakes, it doesn't hurt to say, you know what? I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? We need to own up to our sins, our mistakes, our failures, our faults. Uh, People will look at us different when we own up to stuff. And when we tell them that we're sorry. Because we're humans and we struggle. Let me close with this. A story of a fellow by the name of Robert Woodruff. He was the president of Coca-Cola from 20, 1923 to 1955. It's a, a 32-year span, very long time. But he cast the following vision for Coca-Cola right after World War II. This is what he said. He said, in my lifetime, I want everyone in the world to have tasted Coke. In my lifetime, that's, that's what I want. I want everyone in my lifetime to have tasted Coke all over the world. Romans 10.1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. What's your desire in life, friends? What is your desire? Is your vision that everyone in your lifetime has received Jesus, have heard of him? have received him. It should be our ultimate desire in life for everyone to know and taste Jesus Christ. Amen. Please make that your desire, your goal today. Make a difference right now. Make a decision in your life that you are going to change, that you're going to be more real with your faith, and you can, you can touch a life. Start with your friends. And just make it simple. Don't make it so difficult. Yeah? Gene, are you coming forward now? I think Gene wants to close in prayer. I was going to pray, but he said he was, and I don't want to take anything away from Gene. Come on up. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. That was an awesome message. You know, you just need, what he, what he just said is that we need first to be a friend. Be a friend with those who have not come to know Jesus yet. It begins with a friendship. And when they see Jesus in you, they will follow you. And God will give you that opportunity to, to say the words, say, yeah, come with me, come follow me. And the people will follow you know, yesterday I had a chance to talk with Pastor Kelly and Stacy, and one of the things that <coughs> caught my mind is, it's not about what kind of program I want to run, or th- I want to do this, I want to do that, but it's about what God's will. What is my God's will for me to do in this church, for the people? And I know he's the type that's willing to just trash his plans and takes God's will. And that, I think, is the most important key, that it's not his program, but it's God's will. And that's what I like about him. <clears throat> you know, as we, before I close, it's, uh, just to remind you that uh, we have uh, lunches available for each one of you. They're in the Ohana room in the back, that you can go back there and pick it up. And this includes all of our visitors today. And we ask that, you know, you pick up the lunch that is for you. It's not for your family back home, okay? It's just for you. So we just, I believe we have enough. And it, I, it's just awesome to see all of you here today. To be able, I think God's plan to bring you here to just be able to listen to the message. I think he touched your heart. He touched my heart. And that's what we want to do. Just a simple thing. Be a friend. <coughs> Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this precious moment. 
the time that uh, you brought Pastor Kelly here, even through the adversities, that you brought him here safely, to be able to share the message that you have put on his heart. Lord, we just give you so much praise and glory. We just, you're such an awesome God. There is none like you, Lord God. I, Lord God, I know that you have a plan for each one of us. And we trust that you will just lead us into that direction, Lord. And just to be able to step up and just follow you. Lord, we just want to pray for the meal that's been prepared for us. Be a nourishment to our bodies and be encouraged. Let us use this time to fellowship with each other. To be an encouragement. Just to be able to talk about all God has done in your life. Lord, as we go, <clears throat> as we leave this morning, we just ask for your protection. We ask for the blood of Jesus to be a covering, not over each one of us, but our home and our family. Thank you, Lord, that you are all that we have, that we worship you with all of our hearts. And as we go, we give you praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. And all people said, Amen. Amen. Let's go out and let's love God. Let's live aloha and let your light shine. And our Pastor Kelly and Stacy will be also in the back. You'll be able to chat with them and to be able to get to know them. And so just enjoy, enjoy the day that the Lord has blessed us with. Worship him. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King Praises of the King rise among us, let it rise. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us, let it rise. Let it rise. 